All right. Live. And here's the three PowerPoints. Okay, you can fix, fix it for this one's first. First. I yeah, will use the clicker, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. I'll take care. Okay. So, okay. I'd like to welcome all of you to our uh, panel discussion this afternoon. Uh, to note a correction on the advertisement, this is a discussion uh, on physician-assisted dying slash death, not suicide. It's important that we're using the, tech, the terminology, rather, of the Supreme Court in this case. And those of you on YouTube uh, have received the handouts, and you'll notice terminology with description. And those of you here in the room, I uh, hope you have picked up a copy that you can take home and uh, follow along today as we have this discussion. My name is John Henderson. I'd like to welcome you all here. Uh, and for those of you in the room here, the washrooms are straight down the hall, past the principal's office. And if you've been here before, you know where the principal's office is, I'm sure. Um, and... <laughs> You didn't get called in. <laughs> I get called in periodically and I got out. Didn't get the strap though, so that was good. I want to give thanks to uh, Pam McCarroll, who is our moderator today. Pam did a bit of legwork by uh, getting in contact with chaplains that she knew through CASC. And that's not a whiskey cask, that's the Canadian Association of Spiritual Practice, right? Spiritual care. Spiritual care and uh, asked them if they had recommendations of people for this panel. And uh, so they made a number of recommendations. And so we've got our three panelists this afternoon. We're delighted. And I think we got a lot, a lot of confidence that these people were recommended by uh, chaplains with whom they work. In other words, they had that kind of respect from them. Uh, so I'm going to invite Pam to come and introduce the panel, make some opening remarks, and hope you enjoy. And just a reminder to those on YouTube, if you want to ask questions at the Q&A period, uh, email me, uh, pick it up here in my Blackberry. Uh, I've indicated that to you before, and you can check out my email on your own email that I sent you. Well, it's great to be here, uh, uh, and it's wonderful that Knox is hosting this opportunity for discussion. Um, as many of you know, the way has been opened up since the Supreme Court ruling last year for legislation to be created regarding uh, uh, assisted dying in, in the Canadian context. And so now is a time for a lot of discussion. The, the Liberal government now has it as a priority to look at the Minister of Health, who incidentally is the daughter of one of our Knox College grads uh, and uh, Presbyterian minister. Um, uh, she has it as one of her top agenda items to be working on over the next while. Um, so this is a real time for dialogue and for really thinking about what does this mean for us in in Canadian society, uh, in being church in Canadian society, to really reflect and, and to really have safe spaces for the kinds of discussions that need to happen. Um, this is one of those topics that can be very emotional and can have a lot of feeling attached to it. So what we're trying to do here is to, to, to create a safe space for questions to be asked, for, for learning to happen. And, and so we're hoping that this can be a part of that larger national discussion that is going on right now. Um, I'm so delighted that the three uh, speakers are able to be with us. It was great to be part of a uh, 
conference call a few weeks ago when I got to hear all of the different places they were coming from in terms of reflecting on this topic. So I think we're in for a, a feast today. Um, um, they all come from different perspectives and will be bringing their different lens to view on the topic, uh, their different experiences, and I'll be introducing them shortly. Uh, first of all, just I think everybody has the handouts in the room has the handouts. If you don't have one yet, there are copies at the back. Uh, and this will be especially for the first two presenters uh, important because it addresses some of the distinctions that are made in the terminology, especially in some of the history of what's gone on uh, over the last couple of decades in Canada around this question. So how we're going to frame the day is we'll have first uh, each of the, the speakers will have about 20 minutes uh, to present uh, their presentation all of them have PowerPoint presentations uh, we'll, we'll begin um, uh, with Dr. Ann Woods and then we'll move to Peter Alat and then uh, Dr. Tom O'Connor um, and I'll be introducing them but they'll have 20 minutes I invite you to write your questions down during that time, okay? Because we're going to have uh, a robust conversation once they've finished their uh, presentations. I will, at the end of the, the hour that the three of them will be presenting, I'll probably invite them to speak, to engage each other a little bit more on some of the questions that have come up between them. We'll have a break, probably somewhere around three o'clock, and then we'll be open for your questions that um, uh, will be from people who are online as well as people in the room, okay? Uh, so first, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Ann Woods. Ann will be our first speaker today. Um, Ann has been a full-time palliative care physician for more than 20 years with experience in acute care, complex care, and in the community. Uh, she is a palliative medicine physician at St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton, where she's worked since 1994 and also served as medical director of palliative care at McMaster Hospital between 1994 to 99, and then St. Joe's from 2000 to 2011. Uh, Anne has a background, an undergraduate degree in English, diploma in nursing, and a master's degree in divinity. So you can see she brings together a lot of different disciplines. Uh, she studied medicine at McMaster University where she also completed a residency in family medicine. And she's a fellow of the College of Family Physicians of Canada and a certificant with the American Board of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. She's assistant clinical professor at McMaster University where she's just finished her term as director of the Division of Palliative Care and where she continues to teach. Anne participates in a number of research, education, and administrative committees at the university and in the hospital in Hamilton. She's involved currently in palliative care research for people with esophageal cancer and for patients in the ICU. And Anne spends most of her time, and I know this well, at the bedside and loves what she does. Uh, on a personal note about 20 years ago, I was a spiritual care resident at McMaster Hospital, and I was very um, new to the whole world of hospital work, and Anne was the physician with whom I worked in the palliative care team and learned so much uh, from Anne. So it's such a delight to uh, connect again and to also remember all the learning I've done uh, under Anne's leadership. Uh, uh, Peter Alat is a clinical ethicist, um, and Peter is here from Bridgepoint Health uh, for, in the Mount Sinai Health System. Uh, Bridgepoint is, as you know, you see that big, beautiful new hospital by the DVP if you drive past. It's just been, been redone. He's taught clinical, organizational, and research ethics since 1985. His current research includes, and you can ask him about some of this afterwards because it's very interesting when you ask, uh, includes quality of life feeds, um, how to support people or how to think about the question of people wanting, you can correct me on this, Peter, uh, uh, who, who uh, would like to continue eating even when they, it are, there are issues of safety and, and danger involved in their eating. End of life decision making, and the development of gra a graphic values history tool 
uh, Peter was explaining this to me that this is a way when when someone's asked what are their values it's very hard for people to usually respond like this you know and to sort of get that into a workable format to work with in a hospital setting he's developing a tool where this can be very person-centered and invite people to really reflect on what it is they value most and how that connects with their uh, desires for care uh, he earned an MA in bioethics from the University of Western Ontario and a Master's of Health Sciences and Administration from the University of Toronto. And he serves on the Research Ethics Board and the Clinical Ethics Committee at Bridgepoint Health. And I had an opportunity last week at the Canadian Association of Spiritual Care, the regional conference. I kind of decided I saw Peter was going to be on a panel there. So I thought that was a great opportunity uh, to meet him ahead of time. So it was, it was a really wonderful panel. And I, I can uh, tell you that it's wonderful to have him here with us today. Um, really excellent, thoughtful engagement on the topic. And then Tom O'Connor, uh, by the pen name Thomas St. James O'Connor, you might know him, uh, is a, a THD and a registered psychotherapist and professor emeritus in pastoral counseling and spiritual care and psychotherapy at Waterloo Lutheran Seminary at Wilfrid Laurier University. And he's also an associate clinical professor in family medicine at McMaster University. He's an approved supervisor with the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy and a CPE and a PCE supervisor in the Canadian Association of Spiritual Care. He, uh, much to his joy, retired a year and a half ago uh, from Waterloo Lutheran Seminary, uh, but continues to run all sorts of pastoral counseling uh, training, and he's doing it at Trinity Care, a retirement home and long-term care facility in Kitchener. Uh, he's authored and co-authored uh, five books and over 50 articles in academic journals. His research includes spiritual care, narrative therapy, and spiritual reflection. And he is married to Elizabeth Meeks, with whom he does a lot of research uh, together. Uh, and they ha she has a private practice, and they share uh, their daughter, Angel Marie. Uh, and I can say as well, uh, Tom is someone who, for me who has been such an important mentor and supervisor over the last two decades since uh, being in my very first clinical pastoral education unit in 1993 under his leadership. So, uh, and one of the gifts uh, there is that Tom has been so encouraging of students to, to participate uh, in research and equipping them to participate in research. So I'm grateful for that. So wonderful to have Tom's perspective coming from a more pastoral uh, angle and really thinking it through as a congregational minister approach, but also from a kind of spiritual care approach within the hospital setting. So a real joy to have you all here. Can you clap with me as we welcome them? So I think we can move right ahead, unless there are any questions, sort of logistical questions, everybody has what they need. Perfect. So I think we'll move ahead. I'll invite Anne forward first, and then Peter will be coming forward, and then Tom, okay? Do you know how to? Thank you. And which of these mouses should we use? That one. Thank you. Well, this is this is Peter's. This one's mine. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me. This afternoon, what I hope to do together is to think about the Supreme Court decision and to think together about how we will respect the decision and implement it so that we can benefit the people we care for. I was asked to speak about the physician response to the Supreme Court, and I'm going to do that. I'd like also to talk about where we go from here. But in getting to those points, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the Supreme Court decision and then what dying is like today in Canada. 
So Pam gave me 20 minutes and I sent her an email today, yesterday to say, I'm gonna, I'm over, I'm gonna cut it down. And I sent her another one today that said, I've actually increased it. <laughs> and she wrote back and said, apparently, the first bit's a bit boring. If you could just skip to the, the position part, that would be better. But what I'd really like to do is take you through the Supreme Court decision, just so that we're all on the same page. But where I really want to start is with Gloria Taylor. And what I'm going to do is actually use the Supreme Court language for the first half of my talk. I was prepared to argue against the Supreme Court and to be really not like what they said. I'm a palliative care doc. so. Um, but I read it, some of it is quite beautiful, some of it is very person-centered, but their language is very intentional, so I haven't changed their language. But I wanted to start with Gloria Taylor because this is where we all start. This is where, as pastors, as ethicists, as physicians, as nurses, as healthcare providers, we start with the person in front of us. And this is Gloria Taylor, who was one of the people who challenged um, the court. And this is actually, I'm going to read this first part. It's taken directly from the Supreme Court documents. The impetus for this case arose in 2009 when Gloria Taylor was diagnosed with a fatal neurodegenerative disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, which causes progressive muscle weakness. ALS patients first lose the ability to use their hands and feet, then the ability to walk, chew, swallow, speak, and eventually breathe. Like Sue Rodriguez before her, Gloria Taylor did not want to die slowly, piece by piece, or racked with pain. By 2010, Ms. Taylor's condition deteriorated to the point that she required a wheelchair to go more than a short distance and was suffering pain from muscle deterioration. She required home support for assistance with the daily tasks of living, something that she described as an assault on her privacy, dignity, and self-esteem. She continued to pursue an independent life despite her illness, but found that she was steadily losing the ability to participate fully in that life. Ms. Taylor informed her family and friends of a desire to obtain a physician-assisted death. She did not want to live a bedridden state, stripped of dignity and independence. She said, she said also, nor did she want to die an ugly death. This is how she explained her desire to seek physician-assisted death. I do not want my life to end violently. I do not want my mode of death to be traumatic for my family members. I want the legal right to die peacefully at the time of my own choosing in the embrace of my family and friends. I know that I'm dying, but I'm far from depressed. I have some downtime. That is part and parcel of the experience of knowing that you are terminal. But there is still a lot of good in my life. There are still things like special times with my granddaughter and family that bring me extreme joy. I will not waste any of my remaining time being depressed. I intend to get every bit of happiness I can wring from what is left of my life so long as it remains a life of quality. But I do not want to live a life without quality. There will come a point when I will know that enough is enough. I cannot say precisely when that time will be. It is not a question of when I can't walk or when I can't talk. There's no preset trigger moment. I just know that globally, there'll be some point in time when I will be able to say, this is it. This is the point where life is just not worthwhile. When that time comes, I want to be able to call my family together, tell them of my decision, say a dignified goodbye and obtain final closure for me and for them. My present quality of life is impaired by the fact that I am unable to say for certain that I will have the right to ask for physician-assisted dying when that enough is enough. I live in apprehension that my death will be slow, difficult, unpleasant, painful, undignified, and inconsistent with the values and principles I have tried to live by. What I fear is a death that negates as opposed to concludes my life. In 2011, Gloria Taylor, along with four others, the Carter family, Lee Carter and Hollis Johnson, her husband, Dr. William Scheuchett, 
and the British Columbia Silver Liberties Association challenged the constitutionality of the Criminal Code of Canada. The Criminal Code of Canada that they challenged, there were two sections in particular. Section 241B, it said, everyone who aids or abets a person in committing suicide commits an indictable offence. And Section 14, no person may consent to death being inflicted on them. These were the sections that prohibited physician-assisted dying. On the other hand, the Charter said, and particularly it was Section 7, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. In 2012, the British Columbia Supreme Court ruled that the Criminal Code of Canada provisions against assisted dying violated the rights of the gravely ill. The federal government of Canada appealed the decision and it went to the BC Court of Appeal. The BC Court overturned the original uh, ruling and upheld the ban on physician-assisted dying, citing the 1993 Rodriguez case. What happened then was that the BC um, Civil Liberties Association appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada agreed to hear the appeal. What was interesting is why they did that. Because why would a court that's already ruled on something agree once again to hear an argument? And they can hear an argument from a lower court in two cases. If there's a new legal issue that's being raised, or if there's a change in circumstances or evidence that fundamentally shifts the understanding of that. And the Supreme Court felt that this appeal met both of those. That in fact, the legal understanding had developed in the last 20 years, and also that society had changed and that we had new experience of dying and physician-assisted dying. So they allowed the appeal. On February 6th of this year, 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously ruled that the existing law prohibiting assisted dying was unconstitutional. So that was all nine judges <coughs> agreed. And this in the ruling is what they said. Section 241B and Section 14 of the Criminal Code unjustifiably infringe Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and are of no force or effect to the extent that they prohibit physician-assisted death for a competent adult person who clearly consents to the termination of life and two, who has a grievous and irremediable medical condition, including an illness, disease, or disability that causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual in the circumstances of his or her condition. And I'll come back to this twice more during the talk, but what they did is they struck down the criminal code. And they did it based on three principles of fundamental justice. And what they had said in the ruling was this, laws that impinge on life, liberty, or security of the person must not be arbitrary, overbroad, or have consequences that are grossly disproportionate to their object. And so in the next couple of minutes, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about their thinking. So what the Supreme Court said was that an absolute prohibition impinges on the right to life. They had heard a lot of affidavits from people all over the country initially, um, but particularly when it went to the Supreme Court. And what they said was the prohibition deprives some individuals of life, and it has the effect of forcing some individuals to take their own lives prematurely for fear that they would be incapable of doing so when they reached the point where suffering was intolerable. They also said that a prohibition on physician-assisted dying impinges on the rights to liberty and security. An individual's response to a grievous and irremediable medical condition is a matter critical to their dignity and autonomy. The prohibition denies people in this situation the right to make decisions concerning their bodily integrity and medical care and thus entrenches their liberty. And by leaving them to endure intolerable suffering, it impinges on their security of the person. A prohibition on physician-assisted dying is also overbroad. What they said was that the object of the prohibition is to protect vulnerable people 
from being induced to commit suicide at a time of weakness. However, the prohibition, the prohibition catches people outside the class of protected persons. It creates, in effect, a duty to live. And so the court talked about the sanctity of life and said that it is one of our most fundamental societal values. But it also noted that the sanctity of life is no longer um, seen to require that all human life is preserved at all costs. And they talked about section seven of the charter encompassing life, liberty, and security of the person during the time when they're dying. And so what they said was the law has come to recognize that in certain circumstances, an individual's choice about the end of her life is entitled to respect. They also said that an absolute prohibition is not the least drastic means. And our law says we have to use the least drastic means within a society to accomplish our objective. So what the court said was prohibition, and this was important for doctors, prohibition would have been necessary if the evidence showed that physicians were unable to reliably assess competence, voluntariness, and non-ambivalence in patients, that physicians fail to understand or apply the informed consent requirement for medical treatment, or if the evidence from permissive jurisdictions showed abuse of patients, carelessness, callousness, or a slippery slope leading to the casual termination of life. But they concluded after all the review of the documents, vulnerable populations are not at heightened risk. There's no evidence from permissive jurisdictions that people with disabilities are at heightened risk, risk of assessing physician assisted dying. Concerns about decisional capacity and vulnerability arise in all end of life medical decisions. The risks that Canada and that was the court describes are already part and parcel of our medical system. What they're saying is docs do this every single day. They also said risks can be limited. Vulnerability can be assessed on an individual basis using the procedures that physicians apply in their assessment in, of informed consent and decisional capacity in the context of medical decision making more generally. The risks associated with physician assisted death can be limited through a carefully designed and monitored system. So back to the ruling. What it said was that in certain circumstances, physician-assisted dying will be allowed or no longer prohibited. So for a competent adult person who clearly consents to the termination of his or her life and who has a grievous and irremediable medical condition, including illness, disease, or disability that causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual in the individual circumstances of his or her condition. So what follows? What the court then said was, we've written this, but parliament is better at actually implementing this than we are. This is complex and has nuances. So we're going to leave it to physicians, colleges, and to parliament to deal with this. It also said the charter of rights of patients and the charter of rights for physicians, the charter that includes those rights will need to be reconciled because they may be at odds. I'm gonna move on to something I do know more about, which is how people die in Canada. We know how people die. We know where and when and what age. And this is from 2011, basically showing that people die generally between the ages of 75 and 90 in our um, in Canada. Right now, if you were born today, then as a woman, you would be expected to live to about 83 years and to, as a man to about 79 years. We know how people die. Almost a third of people die from cancer. 25% die from cardiovascular disease. And we know where people die. 60 to 70% of people die in hospitals in acute care facilities. You're more likely to die in hospital if you're in an urban area, less likely if you're in a rural area. Other people die in long-term care or in homes or on the street. We know that people in long-term care, about 50% in any given year are dying and will die that year. We know what people want when they're dying. And you know this as pastors and healthcare workers. And this is just a list that I've taken from the literature, but you will all have heard it. What we need and want 
is to be known, to be safe, to be cared for, to be with those we care for and for those we love to be cared for as well. Some of us wish not to die at any time and at any cost. Most of us want to be able to trust our doctors and wish not to be kept alive when we no longer have hope of a meaningful recovery. We want to ask questions. We hope to be listened to and have our needs recognized by someone who has the imagination to hear us. We want to express our particularity, to not be judged, to not be abandoned, to be able to name the limits to our own suffering and to continue to love until we die. This is from a study that was done across Canada in the major teaching hospitals. And there, this work was taken from all of the background work that had asked people in research, what do you want? And what do you need, especially from your healthcare people as you die? 434 patients um, answered these questions. The first was to have trust and confidence in the doctors looking after you. The second, right across Canada, not to be kept alive on life support when there's little hope for meaningful recovery. The third, that information about your disease be communicated to you by your doctor in an honest manner. To complete things and prepare for life's end. To not be a physical or emotional burden. When they asked families these identical questions, the last two were mirror images of what patients said. So what, pa what families said is, we need to know how to care for the, my loved one and what I can do before that person dies and I don't want them to die in pain or suffering. It was just complete mirror image. We also have a whole body in liter of literature about why people ask us to hasten their death. And people ask us because they're suffering. But the nature of that suffering is multidimensional. And while physical suffering comes into it, it actually is really not the cause. Um, people do not ask for their life to be ended because of pain or shortness of breath. Population deaths. Okay, so, um, and then in uh, 1990, since 1997, there's been about 1,327 scripts written and about 65% of those people have actually taken the medication. Um, as far as the age goes, again, just as with Anne was saying, majority of people that are acting on this are in the 65 and older age category um, with about 68% uh, 60, um, of people are 65 and over and the mean of 72. Um, as far as education goes, the majority of people that are acting on this are in the higher educated gr group with a bachelor's degree or more. And um, similar to what Anne was saying, um, cancers and ALS are the primary underlying illnesses that the people have that are requesting the uh, physician-assisted death. People that are requesting this, the interesting thing about Oregon, and it'll be fascinating to see how does this relate to what happens in Canada, majority of people are at home, dying at home. Um, as you can see here um, on the far right hand side, 94.6% of people over the 17 years have been dying at home, their own home, a friend's home, et cetera. Um, Long-term care facilities, uh, 37, uh, sorry, 4%. Uh, very small percentage in hospital. And will the same thing happen in uh, Canada? We, we don't know. Um, but it'll be a very interesting uh, for some comparison um, further on. Why are people asking for it? What are their, their end of life concerns? Loss of autonomy throughout the entire time that they have had the uh, death with dignity legislation. Concerns about their quality of life 
a diminished quality of life and loss of dignity. Those are the three main reasons people are requesting it. Okay, I want to move and talk about conscientious objection. So conscientious objections, you I'm sure are aware, it's a legal practice that, uh, uh, sorry, it is a refusal to partake in a legal practice, uh, something that is within somebody's uh, scope of practice, and they're refusing to do this on moral grounds, cultural grounds, religious grounds. Um, it is a process for the balancing out of two competing goods, the right of a person not to participate in something that they don't want to, to do, and the right of somebody else, the patient, to get the equitable access to, to this. And what does the uh, legislation say about this? Well, we're going to have to wait and see. But I can tell you what some of the other documents um, say about this. CPSO, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, they have said that there must be an effective referral. First of all, people don't have to participate in it, but there has to be an effective referral. And that that effective referral means that it needs, needs to be done in good faith, not to a non-objecting, available, and accessible physician. And then it, that also has to be done in a timely manner. I would want to say right from the get-go that this is being challenged by the uh, Christian Medical Dental Association. And um, so again, another area that we don't know what is going to be the outcome of it is our legislation. If we get some legislation, is it going to have a conscientious objection clause in it? Probably. What's it going to be, actually look like? No, we're not 100% sure. And what's going to be the outcome of this court case? Um, we'll have to stay tuned to find out. CPSO policy, however, points out that um, physician-assisted death is not to be considered an emergency, and that is really important because an emergency uh, physician can be compelled to do something. What about the CMA, Canadian Medical Association? They're, they're saying that, again, physicians not obliged to participate in, in this. Um, physicians, however, are expected to provide complete information on all the options available uh, including assisted dying and advise the patient how they can access se uh, separate central information, assuming there is going to be central uh, information available, counseling and referral. Doesn't say they have to do the referral, but is, and so that will again be something interesting to see what actually comes out in it. Canadian Nurses Association says, that they need to be able to provide good care during that period of time. You can't abandon the patient. And that is a major tenant throughout pretty well any of the conscientious objections writing. So a couple of questions I want to present to you about this. First and foremost, since I'm speaking to folks in spiritual care, what is conscientious objection going to look like in spiritual care. That'll be a very interesting thing to um, consider. And hopefully during the, the discussion, we can have some uh, talk about, about that. Is there going to be an obligation to discuss, to inform? Is there going to be an obligation to refer? And this goes for all healthcare providers, including spiritual care, not just for, for the physician. And what about to provide the service? Probably not for the latter, but what about spiritual care? Is there going to be an obligation for you to provide services to people who are also requesting assisted death? In Oregon, you can see that whether or not person chooses to participate in this, 
that there is an obligation to openly discuss it. There is an obligation to explore the meaning of the request. And it goes on to point out that some of the people that have that done in a caring, compassionate way, that's the end of it. They want to make sure that those concerns are heard and that they're being addressed. Obviously, there will be others that will want to go beyond that. Well, for organizations, will organizations be permitted to use conscientious objection? What about regional health authorities or LINs? Um, particularly, for example, in Alberta, there's only one regional health authority. So would they be allowed to conscientiously object? Um, what about hospitals, um, nursing homes, community agencies, et cetera? What will happen if there is block, a whole group of organizations or practitioners choose not to participate in, in this? What will happen in that? that circumstance and this is important because is there going to be an obligation to ensure that this is available to people what about those small facilities such as long-term care facilities where there's only one dock for the entire facility where there's only one nurse on board at any one time, one RN on board at any one time. What happens when they want to conscientiously object? How does the resident, don't forget that's their home, how does the resident get access to this if that's what they want? And what about pharmacists who refuse to stock the meds? Refuse to fill the script? And that, in downtown Toronto, that may be something that is not a totally, uh, is not an issue. Because, you know, we have shoppers on every single street corner, almost as many as we have Tim's. But there are major parts of this country where there could be only one pharmacy for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers around. And what happens in that case? So what, what would conscientious objection look like in that sort of a situation? And lastly, what about community agencies? Particularly if you go back to the whole idea in Oregon and, and other jurisdictions where people die at home, that's, you ask people, they prefer to die at home. That is the case. We have more and more of the physician assisted death at home and community agencies are involved. What is going to happen if those community agencies or the staff within them choose to conscientiously object? Thank you very much. <laughs>
and referred to the chaplain. Uh, why doesn't God take me? I want to die. I've lived a good life and I'm ready to go. My wife comes in every day and I'm such a burden to her and my children. My son died 25 years ago and I want to be with him. Why doesn't God take me? I want to die and not be a burden. Um, this chaplain, uh, this was actually a case presented uh, in our group a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> wouldn't have been, um, was really aware of this, <laughs> of the, the, the recent decision, and so this had different implications. Um, so as we look at the patient, and some of this has already been covered by Peter and Ann, the, the patient is accepting his, of death. Death is close. He knows he's, it's coming. Has a great fear of being a burden to wife and family and feels that is actually the case now. He has a belief in God and the afterlife and wants to be with his son who had already died. And he doesn't seem to have unfinished business. This is not, I mean, I, I've never actually dealt with a requested for, uh, for physician assisted dying, uh, but I, in the long-term care facility, you get a lot of questions from especially older people who say, why doesn't God take me? I'm finished my life, I'm ready to go. If anybody's got an answer to that question, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> um, so we look at the role of the chaplain or the pastor, <clears throat> And it certainly, I think, is to engage in conversation about uh, this request in a non-judgmental way. It's an easy phrase to say. I'll tell you, it's very hard as we get into this. What are the client's thoughts? How does the client see himself as a burden? If the client were to reverse roles with his wife, would he think his wife was a burden to him if she were dying slowly? And also probably to engage with the, uh, the wife with the client's permission. Is this a burden for her? Maybe she doesn't think it's, she's doing this because she loves it. Um, and is the client asking for physician assisted dying? So these were some of the questions my student asked in our supervision. Certainly when we look at the values of this particular client, we can see that the client has a belief in God. This is a, a, and an afterlife and death is not the end and wants to be with his son who died. He has a strong devotion to his family. He's concerned that this is too hard on them coming every day and caring for him. Um, and in this particular case, no, I didn't put that. He had also a strong uh, relationship with his church. His minister came in once a week and visited and was a great support to him. And he, he feels like, and he used this phrase to the, the old phrase from Paul, I've run the race, <laughs> you know, and it's now it's time to go. And he wonders why he has not died yet. Um, so these are some of the, the things that happen. And I think I would say this certainly of myself, you know, I desire a quick death. I don't want a long, lingering, painful death. Uh, and, and this is what this client is also asking for too. So when we look at the values of the chaplain, which is a key thing, we knew very little about this chaplain. However, we can wonder, Usually a chaplain has lots of compassion, that's why they're in this field, and feels with the person dying and their family. Chaplains know that lingering deaths can often exhaust most folks, and it feels like a burden. I've heard uh, more people say that after someone who has been through a long lingering death, they've said, I hate to say this, but I'm relieved he's gone. <laughs> It's too tiring. And then they usually feel a bit of guilt at saying that, this, but it is very exhausting. Uh, chaplains are trained to be non-judgmental and engage in talk. And yet chaplains also have values around the sacredness of life and the protection of the vulnerable. Uh, we heard that uh, in the statement from the Supreme Court and also in the area of compassion. And so a chaplain could be easily con conflicted over insisted dying as well as uh, many pastors. 
And um, as I will say, that's okay. I, I'm, I'm conflicted over this issue. I, I was not theologically trained to think this way. You know, I was so strong in the sacredness of life and compassion and protecting the vulnerable. However, my experience of working in long-term care and as a supervisor, you see a lot of painful deaths and people crying out and saying, God, please take me. And that sense of compassion, yeah, you know, I've prayed for many people to die quickly. And they've asked for that prayer. Can I please just die quickly? Let me go. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the research I've done on some of the statements put out by some of the Christian churches uh, related to this. And there certainly could be exceptions to this, but I couldn't find that, but I assume there are exceptions to what I'm going to say. Most Christian groups affirm the sacredness of life. It's a very strong value from birth to death. The protection of the vulnerable and compassion and care for sick and dying. And there's been a long history of this. Many of the Christian faith groups have put a lot of money and effort into hospitals and hospices and all these sorts of things out of care and compassion for those who are sick and in need. And in the statements, and this is, I'm just looking in Canada by Roman Catholic, United uh, Church, Anglican, Presbyterian, warn against euthanasia. Now they don't use this word assisted dying. That's, this is, I'm gonna ask Anne about this after. It's assisted suicide that we're so used to the, in these statements. This is sort of a new term. Um, but it's interesting, and, and this was pointed out too uh, in the tension, how does one balance sacredness of life, protection of the vulnerable with compassion and suffering of the patient and the patient request? It's a tremendous tension as you see somebody who's dying, suffering, and it's not happening. And how do you balance that with sacredness and protection of the vulnerable? Now, um, I found this on the, uh, under the Presbyterian Church. This is your uh, moderator. Um, and this was, I guess, his statement on uh, the Supreme Court decision. And this is part of it. As Christians, Presbyterians believe that these decisions should not be made apart from the will of God. This has meant that for Presbyterians, the ultimate decision to take a life does not rest with us as human persons. Until very recently, this was also the law of Canada. As moderator of the 140th General Assembly and as a citizen of this blessed land, I call for a wide public debate shared by Canadians of all backgrounds and professions of all forms of educations, of all religions, and of none. I believe that this debate should not focus narrowly on the implementation of the recent Supreme Court decision, but on the fundamental issues and convictions involved in the ending of human life. I guess that's what today's about. That's following his direction. But I, I really like this last phrase, and I'm going to come back to it. I call on Presbyterians to take a humble, respectful and faithful role in any such debate. So if you were a pastor with a member in a long-term care facility or maybe dying at home and you were faced with this issue, what, what might you do? Because <laughs> it might happen. Um, now we know, and we just heard from Peter, physicians are not required uh, due to conscience to facilitate assisted dying. But there's some parameters around this. And I'm wondering, and, and Peter raised this question, that ought to apply also to pastors and chaplains in spiritual care. I mean, and again, there's parameters around this, but people have strong values. And sometimes if, if they are really against, it's best not to deal with the situation because you try to convince the patient not to do this. 
that's what ends up happening. It's almost become sermonizing. You know, this isn't what God wants. And so I, I think you need, I tell my students, you have to be aware, first of all, of your own values around the issue and how they come in. Um, however, a chaplain can disagree. And I would say that would be the probably the majority of my students now from what I've seen. And or be conflicted. So they're not certain. And still offer care. Now that's a possibility, and the, the concept I'm using is from um, uh, Friedman and Bowen, the concept of self-differentiation, which means you have a non-anxious presence in the midst of this dialogue. Now, um, as Pam mentioned, this is a highly charged issue, so that might not be possible, you know, because the values are so strong. Uh, but a, a self-differentiated position says, and this is strong in family therapy, you're different from me, but we still can be connected. Doesn't mean we have to agree, we have to do the same things, um, but so you want physician-assisted dying, it's, a, I'm not, it's, it's against my values, however, I'll continue to dialogue with you. That's the non-anxious presence. It's um, quite a great thing if you can get it <laughs> in a highly charged situation. Uh, and I think that's what uh, your moderator, take a humble, respectful, and faithful role in any debate. I think that captures what that is. Um, Daniel Goleman has written a book and many others. This is what the term we use is also called emotional intelligence. Learning how to manage your own feelings and dealing with very conflicted situations. So the idea is open space for talk. Try not to shut it down. Why are you interested in this? One does not have to hold the same values as clients or family in order to discuss an issue. I can disagree and I will stand with you. Now there's a book out also by Klebisch and Jekyll called uh, Pastoral Care and Historical Perspectives. This is sort of uh, looking at the Christian tradition and they see four roles in pastoral care, guiding, healing, sustaining and reconciling. And this is more in the guiding area. You're sort of engaging in, in the conversation with the person and looking at the possibilities. Now, uh, the chaplain has to know where he or she stands on the issue. And being conflicted is okay. That, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and... <laughs> As I said, I've never actually dealt with this issue, but I've dealt with others. Clients will ask you, where do you stand on this? Um, can you engage in a conversation with a client without judging their request? You could easily, because I've also got this in other scenarios with older people with, you know, they look back on their life, they say, do you think I'm going to hell? And uh, <laughs> it's a loaded question, you know, that's just, now you could easily get this here. You know, if I, if I do this, am I going to hell? Um, my answer is, I don't know. I, that's, that's beyond me. You put me in the role of judge and I'm not the judge. Um, the other thing that often happens in these situations is the family could be conflicted over this. And this could bring out other conflicts. So if we go back to that case that I was working, how would his wife feel if he wants to uh, doctor-assisted suicide? And how would his kids feel, their adult kids? And sometimes when you get into these highly emotional areas, especially around values and ethics, it brings up other issues in the family. 
<laughs> you know, previous hurts they had between each other, and then you're into a whole a, a real mishmash. So that it's sort of a spiraling effect. Um, so yeah, how would the wife and children? So these are feeling this scenario. Another issue is if members of the church knew, how would they affect, how would this affect them? And how, what would the minister say at this man's funeral? So here are just some of the books I mentioned, Pastoral Care and Historical Perspective by Klebesh and Jacob, Friedman, Generation to Generation, Family Process in Church and Synagogue, and Goldman's Emotional Intelligence. I don't quite know how to get this off, but... Um, well, thank you all. It's great, all these different perspectives. Um, I'm wondering if we could have, if you folks are available to come up here for a few minutes just to engage each other a little bit, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a bit of a break and, and uh, invite questions from, from the audience, okay? So are you okay to come up here and I'll pass the microphone between you? So, so my first question is either for uh, Peter or Ann. I was always used to doctor-assisted suicide. And all of a sudden the term is now doctor or physician-assisted dying. So what happened? I was saying earlier that I was the person on the panel who said we well, needed to use the right language because the Supreme Court has used physician-assisted dying and physician-assisted death. So, um, but one of the things that, um, I'll just, lost this microphone. One of the things that um, my colleagues have said is that we participate in physician-assisted physician dying all the time. We help people die, um, but not hasten their death. And this is a distinction. So. A number of physicians have started using physician hasten death, although the legal terms that I think we're going to see are physician assisted um, dying, physician assisted death, and Quebec uses medical aid in dying. So it's a slightly different one, but I think those are going to be the correct terms. Um, it's on, it's okay. It's on? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> I think it's been an evolutionary process. And one of the things that some people have argued is that take out the word suicide because it's got such negative connotations and put in aid in, in dying because these people are already dying. The other person who is, um, attempting suicide, they're for the most part not in a dying process, whereas all of the other people are in, in a dying process, they're getting some assistance in it. Another question from the panel to each other? I have a comment on, on one of the things that Tom said I wanted to really underscore um, as a, an ethicist, the need to know your values. I, I really love that part. Um, there's so much work have been done in the area of moral distress in, in bioethics. And I think this is going to be a potential area where we're going to have more moral distress arising and I think it's so important for people. And I've said this to students as they come through the, the um, hospital in the last year since we've had this decision, that you need to really examine your values because when you're looking around for a job, you really have to think about what it is that you might be asked to do 
and whether you would be able to do it. Because if you're constantly asked to participate in someone's um, death, that was going to have wear and tear on you. And so if you are really fundamentally opposed to it, maybe you shouldn't get a job in um, the community or in a nursing home where conscientious objection may be very difficult. And maybe you should work in a hospital where there's more staff around and as a result, some more choice. And if the stats pan out from um, Oregon, there may be even less of the instances in our hospitals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Other comments? Go ahead. Oh, just a, a, a little comment. Um, Tom, you were saying, what will the pastor say at the funeral? Um, physicians are asking the same thing as, what do I put on a death certificate? And how will this affect insurance? Mm. Mm. Right. right. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel to each other or questions that came up within the panel? I, I just wondered, I mean, on your, on your uh, Peter, on your thing about conscientious objection, like how would that apply to say a pastor or chaplain who just can't do this? Like, you know, I mean, you, you have doctors who say, I, I don't want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. And yet he's the only chaplain in the uh, in the in the facility. Or so, anyways. I... So I, th I think this is um, a time that we need to really examine our own values. And uh, you know, if you're working in a facility and you've got one person, maybe you need to work with administration and get somebody else who could potentially come in every once in a while when this arises because I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. There's some people who can respectfully disagree, but still work with the, the individual. What was the language you used? Um, the non-anxious presence. Um, beautiful language there. And I think that would be really ideal if we could have that, but we know very well. Because these are our values that are integral to the very being of some of us, we can't just put it aside. And so we might need to get our buddy who can help us out. And the other thing is, some people might be able to do this once in a while, but what happens if you get two or three in a row? You might need that buddy to be able to spell you off while you you take a break because you just can't do this yet again in such a short period of time i know i'm not on the panel but one question related to that has there been any work done in oregon around um uh compassion fatigue or uh, moral distress especially moral distress around um healthcare people working with people requesting there there has and um there's in my list of uh, suggested readings in this thing, there's um, the, uh, a guidebook. There's a reference to a guidebook, and it's got in there um, a number of suggestions for for um, healthcare providers of all different types to um, address their compassion fatigue, their, their moral um distress that they're experiencing and also um suggestions on uh asking people about their um request go going into it with them and um so there's a number of good guidance pieces right. in there any other questions from the panel Okay, I think I think there are lots of questions out here, and I think I encourage you to write them down. We're going to take about uh, how long a break do you recommend, John? Fifteen minute break, and then we'll come back for your questions. So uh, please be ready with them because I know our panelists will be happy to engage them. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah the sign. Yeah. yeah. Let's gather together, folks. Find your chair. Find your chair or your chair might disappear. And you'll have to stand. So you can start off. Roadshow. So welcome back to uh, to our panel and to all of you. Does this is this coming through okay? Um, we, we need to use these ones, so there are certain microphones that only pick it up for those who are on, hearing us by YouTube. But we want the ones, thank you, perfect. We want the ones that can help us listen, hear each other in the classroom as well as on YouTube. So um, so I'd like to open things up for questions. And John Henderson has a microphone that he will pass around. And for those of you who are online, please email or text, email your Questions to John. So, question, Susan. My question is, um, if your loved one um, and you, as a couple, have discussed end of life, and you have said that you don't want to be um, kept alive if you are in a in a non well, a vegetative state, and you've written in your will, you've talked to your doctor, you've made your wishes very clear to your family, and uh, say you fall down the stairs and you become completely incompetent. Um, what, how, do, how uh, is that, are you still allowed the, the right to die? Okay, so I'll pass that to uh, Anne and Peter. I'm going to start with some of the pragmatics, and then Peter can talk about the ethics. If what you said is you don't want your life prolonged under these circumstances, then certainly we can follow that guidance that we won't prolong your life. So we don't need to treat you, we don't need to put you on ventilators, dialysis, IVs, all sorts of things. If the question is, can we now um, hasten your death or provide physician-assisted dying? The answer is no. And I'll let Peter talk about that. Um, and the to, to that, I would also add, um, we could also withdraw life support that has already been started if by chance we put you on life support 
um, while the uh, family were coming in and we were trying to figure out exactly what had happened to you um, and uh, the extent of the injuries, we could stop that life support that we had already started. But I agree with what Anne said that um, under the rules of the Supreme Court decision, we would not be able to have physician assisted death in this case, even if they were prior stated and applicable wishes, because you are not capable at this time. And we, under the rules of the Supreme Court, we need a capable person at the time of the request. So, and it's in there as a safeguard to try to um, take care of concerns about people being euthanized against their will. Do you want to say something about And then I'm just going to add to what Peter said. There's even a question now, as I understand it, about um, what happens if between the time you request hasten death and the time it's carried out, if you lose your capability and nobody knows the answer to that one quite yet so that's a it's a big issue particularly for doctors because we're one of the things we're asking is enough sort of cooling off time to make sure that people this is a real request this is not just um something and then you get used to it or you change your mind but what happens if you lose capability then or capacity that's an issue one of the things in um when i was talking about the supreme court that i failed to mention was while the Supreme Court struck down um, the criminal code on February the 6th, it gave the government a year to put new legislation in before doctors can act on it. So February the 6th, 2016, um, unless the government has asked for an extension, it may do that because we've got a new government. Unless they've asked for an extension um, to this little hiatus period, then it will be um, not, it won't be legal, it will not be illegal anymore. The question is if we do not have laws in place or the colleges don't have guidance, what are individual physicians going to do? Um, just f another point I would add is an area where I see you not being able to use physician assisted deaths that comes up very frequently. And that is <clears throat> if in the case you said that you didn't want to be having your life extended on life support and you were already on the ventilator and so on um the f and there was going to be a withdrawal even though that withdrawal we expected that it would end in the person's demise we still wouldn't be able to do it in that case if the patient is not capable at that time and in many of the withdrawal cases I, I in my 35 years as an ethicist i've spent 30 years in critical care um, many of those withdrawal situations we are um, having patients who are not um, capable and unfortunately we would not be able to um, do that even if the family were fully supportive It's again, um, one of the um, provisions that is put in place, the safeguards that is put in place to prevent people being euthanized that we don't know their wishes or they um, may not have uh, actually stated wishes, um, getting into the avoluntary and involuntary euthanasia. So they're they're trying to put in some sorts of, um, safeguards. But they, they have said the wishes. That's right. But you need to have be able to say them at the time that this is what you want at the time. It, it's, a, it's a, again a safeguard that is put in place. Um, and not only do you need to be able to say it, you need to be able to say it multiple times. And that's what Anne was just talking about, that there is a, a request orally and in writing and then there's usually a period of time and that is up in question as to how long it'll be and then another request 
Does, it's clear, though, we could still withdraw um, things like ventilators and dialysis. It would be if you didn't die when we did that, and you would hope that we couldn't then go further and end your life. We would still, at that point, not do anything to prolong your life. Um, and people often, in those instances, live a short time. The tragedy is when you know what they want and they don't. They just continue living and living because that's sometimes just not predictable. Right, over to MJ. Um, I'm sorry, I have trouble trusting states. So my question is, for those states that have already implemented physician hastened death, who are have some sort of social medicine programs, how has the legislation or has it had any impact on their resourcing of end of life care? Has it increased or decreased? Has it changed? Is there any real study into it? Or is this a solution? It's sort of nice to go first because then Peter can add all their other um, stuff about the ethics. In, in some cases, it's actually enhanced palliative care, and in part that's because um, with some of the rules and regulations, you really have to make sure that somebody has a true option. You can't offer somebody a choice and then if there's no choice. So in um, in some places, people have to be offered palliative care they um, and actually have to have that as a real choice um, first. Yeah, I was going to say, um, the same thing that um, in almost all of the jurisdictions that I've read about that have physician assisted death, whether they have a socialized medicine or not, they have had an increase in the amount of palliative care. Uh, next question. It, it seems to me from the from the initial question that that uh, there's some social confusion over the difference between physician hastened death and things like do not resuscitate orders and standing uh, standing orders uh, like living wills and, and and that sort of thing. Could you talk about how you navigate the difference now and how you, how you might navigate the difference given the right legislation? I think what I see in the hospital and with patients is that there is a confusion um, in understanding. There's also a wide range of belief about what is ethical or um, what we should be doing. So in terms of do not resuscitate, it's a, usually a discussion that started way back in 1994, again, there's lots of history in terms of the Canadian Medical Association, basically it said um, there are four levels um, for thinking about DNR. So if somebody comes in and they're young and healthy and they've got struck by lightning, of course you're offering resuscitation. There's a second group where you don't know, you don't know who they are. So you're going to offer because you don't know. There's a third group where they have so many comorbidities, you're thinking this may not work, in which case you're supposed to have a discussion. And there's a fourth group where, in fact, the likelihood of CPR being beneficial to that person is so, so low that you shouldn't offer. That still stands in terms of what we do, um, but what the law says is you have to actually have conversations. You can't unilaterally make that decision. Now, when the rubber hits the road though, um, what happens is that we have young doctors in the middle of the night meeting people they've never known and asking that question to people with whom they have no relationship. In circumstances where people don't trust the state, don't trust people they don't know, and know that there's huge, we're $12 billion in debt in our province, there are no hospital beds, um, and so they don't want to answer that question. Or I had a very good, I had a colleague come to me and say, can we just talk about this ethical issue? Because Anne, I just lied. I said, well, what happened? My friend was just admitted through ER. He's lived his life on the street. Um, he's got, he drinks. He doesn't have a normal life. I know he doesn't want to ever be resuscitated, but when they asked me, I told him he's full code. 
because I tell you, I want the best care he would want his pneumonia treated. And I'm really afraid that if people judge against him in the value of his life, they won't give him the same care they would give you or me. Just so, to clarify, full code for people? Full code, full code. So he went ahead and said, I lied. I said, yep, go right ahead. Because what we do know, sometimes when people get busy, um, and if we all have lenses, if we don't look at the person as somebody that is worthy of care, maybe we won't run as fast. We won't give as much care. So that's about CPR. So I'd love to say that we were great at it. We're getting better because young docs have to talk about it. Um, go on to the rest of your question. I Can I just clarify? Was, um, full code means full CPR. Full, full CPR, oh, yeah. So you were asking about the various things. So cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Yeah, and, 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 and I mean, the, the confusion that occurs, right. I, I've seen it in my own right. family and with members of my congregation where they don't want any uh, extraordinary measures taken should such a mess happen, um, which is which is a different line to walk. Yeah. You know, as, as it is, I mean, we have a, an excellent palliative care system in our part of Nova Scotia. Um, they handle these questions very mm -hmm. delicately and very well. Um, but still, in general, the public sees a Supreme Court decision that says, let's change the rules. And they conflate all of these conversations. Um, and so, you know, one of the helpful things for me and for everybody for these discussions is to, is to just 15 pages of definitions, thank you. <laughs> because that's what people need to know, I think. Um, and, and I'm just interested in how, um, you know, you talk about if you don't value the life, maybe we don't run as fast. We're already, as practitioners, as, as chaplains and ministers, asked to deal with people whose life choices we don't agree with. Could we reframe the conscientious objection question in those terms? You know, we know how to do that. I can, I can officiate at a funeral of a suicide victim what I think about suicide doesn't matter. Um, would it be more helpful from your point of view to reframe those kind of questions in, in that you're already dealing with people who live on the street, who, whose life choices have put them in, in uncomfortable positions and have brought much of their illness on themselves, you might say, uh, that doesn't stop treatment. Uh, so we know how to deal with objections. Uh, is that, in your opinions, a more helpful way to enter into that kind of discussion? <laughs> Tom, do you want to just follow up on that? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> and that's often what some of the stuff, like when people say, is this okay? Uh, I, my answer is, I don't know. Um, and it takes a fair amount of reflection and, and, um, and engaging people in conversations. I think that's the sort of uh, careful thing. And I agree with you, with you about the definitions. It's helpful. What are we actually looking at here? That, that sort of to boil it down. Um, but in terms of my own practice, this is going into new territory that I'm not used to. I had pretty clear cut decisions and some of the, my changes, you know, I value the sanctity of life and, uh, protection of the vulnerability, but also being with people who dying, my own sister, uh, uh, a number of years back died of something like ALS and it was very painful and and I wish she would go quickly, you know, and now she never, she lost the ability to communicate. So she couldn't even ask for what she wanted. Um, so I, I haven't sorted that through yet. So what, one of the things that I would uh, refer you to are Anne's 9,000 um, terms <laughs> and, and, um, 
you talked about the no resuscitation. So we're talking about withholding of potentially life-sustaining treatment. And um, now here's where the problem arises in discussions about this. We might use that definition and our patients, your um, parishioners, may have a very different definition and there's there's one of the problems with the discussions about this i'm talking about withholding withholding of life-sustaining treatment and they're talking about you're going to kill them and so um it's it, i think it's really important to use these definitions but also to recognize that others are going to have very different um uh, definitions um, the other thing is, I think I would really uh, emphasize with folks when you're talking to, to them, is uh, the, the difference between not starting something and what you're doing in, in this case, the physician-assisted death, where you are, you're giving somebody something. To, to, and there, there's a very different intent between the two of them. And, and that might be helpful. I, I've had this discussion over the years with many, many people and have found that can be helpful. The other thing I would raise if you're having this discussion with any of your parishioners is um, helping them to understand the efficacy of um, resuscitation. And it, there's a an article that was done in New England Journal of Medicine. It's not like on ER. And um, <clears throat> if you send me an email, I'll send you the article and, and a little handout for families. Um, the thing is, people think because of the TVs that this is always effective. Not only that, they're up and they're talking within the half hour. Yeah. And they're going to go out to dinner, exactly, yes. Whereas we know very well that is not at all the case. And um, so helping them to understand what is going on in these situations in a real life circumstance, it, um, the real facts it is going to be hugely beneficial in that discussion. Next question. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to really thank you for your presentations this afternoon on this very complex issue that is faced by the uh, health care providers and the pastoral and spiritual care providers. It's really opened up my eyes very, very much um, because I'm neither one of those. I'm, I'm um, a person who recently had my husband of 52 years pass away from melanoma cancer that had spread to his lungs and his brain. And we knew that it was coming and we had made very detailed plans. Uh, I've done a lot of research on the topic. I have a postgraduate degree and, and, um, and uh, my sons and I did a lot on this issue. In fact, we were all set to go to Switzerland and I can tell you that in Switzerland, uh, if you lose capacity between the time uh, you get the green light to go, and you get there, you won't be given the prescription. Um, but we were promised some things, and I really feel that the healthcare system let my husband and me down at the end, because um, we, were, we were promised uh, continuous sedation for intractable sy symptoms. And at the end, I really had to fight for that very, very hard. And it was a, a difficult situation. So if anything today, what I implore all of you who are the medical people and the spiritual providers, please get it together and let's get going on this. I, I'm really happy if the Liberal government takes another six months to get it right, because we do need to get it right. And um, so thank you. Thank you to all of you. 
And my question is, uh, I understand that a committee has already been struck in Ontario to study this issue uh, with two co-chairs, one of them being the wife of Dr. Lowe and the other one, uh, an ethicist from the University of Toronto. And I'm sorry, I, I think one's name is Jennifer. I can't remember the other. Do any of you know uh, where we're at with that committee? And also, what could I do because I am going to dedicate myself to helping get the protocol protocols um, established and getting on with it. Okay, I'll start with the panels and Anne will deal with the palliative sedation. How's that? Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's two panels actually. And one of them is a federal panel and it's got a three person panel and um, both pan and, and then there's the provincial territorial panel. It, it, it is um, a joint panel across all of the provinces and, and territories. And it's co-chaired by Jennifer Gibson from the Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto and Don Lowe's wife. Um, and um, the, the two panels have finished their online um, collection of responses to their surveys. They, each panel had a um, had an online survey, and they're both closed um, now. And, and um, so, um, what I would say, if you want to continue providing some some input is um, stay tuned uh, is there going to be a third panel we don't know yet um, is there going to be any more consultation uh, we don't know yet so stay tuned um, and there may be some opportunities for you to um, provide some further input into it particularly if they get to the point of providing some sort of draft policies, regulations, legislation, there might be a consultation at that period of time. Now I turn it over to Can you just Dave. clarify how people would find out about that? Um, so, so if you just put into your favorite search engine, uh, provincial and territorial panel and federal panel on a physician assisted death, it, it will come up. On the bibliographies, the panel, the websites, yeah. Okay. But I went, I went last night, and they're they're both closed for submissions. In terms of palliative sedation, I think it goes back to um, the comment that you were making earlier that a lot of people don't know what's available. Um, healthcare providers themselves are confused um, and they don't understand. Um, they themselves are worried. Um, in terms of sedation for intractable symptoms, there has been um, a consensus guideline published. Larry Liebrach was one of the authors um, Dean and Sorelius, and it's on your bibliography as well. And it outlines um, the sort of the protocol what, that they're thinking about in terms of a Canadian guideline. And it talks about sedation within the last couple of weeks of life for intractable symptoms. And it is for people where it's often not pain, it's often other symptoms that are um, you can't manage, whether it's a delirium or an agitation or something that you've tried everything. And again, sometimes people go through a lot to try everything to be comfortable. It is legal. Um, young docs need to be trained. Nurses need to be to understand it. Otherwise, it feels like euthanasia. They think, oh, we're just going to put somebody to sleep. In fact, the literature shows if done properly, it doesn't hasten death but can make people comfortable, but it's something you do for a symptom or a situation that isn't controlled in other ways. I would say talk about it. Start talking about it. Read the, the guideline. Start just raising it as an issue. One of the things we know is that we're not 
really very literate as a community in talking about dying. Um, that it, I, I was going to say that um, I think it's very much dependent upon the um, clinicians that are involved in the case. I, I've worked for many, many years with uh, palliative care physicians that are very comfortable with this, and I've worked with others, taught taught others that really have a, a great fear, as, as Anne said, about it because. Um, they're afraid of being um, charged with, with aiding and abetting in someone's death. And so that's where the issue is. Yes, in Quebec's, Quebec's legislation actually discussed palliative sedation. And one of the other problems is that there's 9,000 more definitions on just this one concept and um some people call it palliative sedation some people call it terminal sedation and, and it just goes on and on the, the number of different terminologies and slight nuance differences in the definition so again um is our federal legislation going to address this particular issue and it would be really nice if it if it said something Thank you for your willingness to share and to uh, call us uh, to action in that way. Thank you. John? Yes. Um, I, I guess I'm, I have some concern as to whether the sanctity of life applies simply to the ability to breathe or whether it applies to having life which has some quality. And as I reflect back on this, um, I, I'm going back to the case of my own mother who, who died of, of cancer. And the clinician at that time kept telling us, we can increase the medication, we can provide more medication to, to uh, combat the pain and so on and so forth, but it will hasten her death. And so I guess I'm wondering if to some degree we haven't been making this decision for many, many years uh, and haven't been making it in the professional field with consultation with family and so on and so forth. So I'm not accusing of wrongdoing here. I'm simply saying it's been going on. What makes the difference now when finally we have the legislation by which we can do it? Again, I think both Tom and Peter will have sort of some better words. I think there's two things and I think for me it's intentionality and, and it's proportionality, those two things. Often as a physician, I will give whatever medication is needed to help somebody not suffer anymore because nothing asks us to, to make people continue to be in pain or have shortness of breath or be nauseated. And so what I can do is increase that medication as needed. We do know that if we, if we increase it rapidly or disproportionately, it may hasten death. And we also know that sometimes as we're doing it even just judiciously, people are on the edge and it may. I think in that case for me, it's always been where I'm heading, which is comfort um, and relief of suffering. And the intentionality is not that I'm trying to end their life. Now the end comes out sometimes the same. People worry about that. And certainly the nurses that I work with worry about it. Um, and my colleagues do. And certainly I know when reading some of the, the documents by people, um, um, in, the, in the legal system, I think it's the same. And maybe the outcome's the same, but what we were aiming for wasn't. I think docs also probably have in the past also just talked to people about what's suffering. Um, and sometimes it's not just physical. We have a hard time with that as a society. And even um, now thinking about this, ending somebody's life who has existential suffering is going to be really difficult for many people because how do you how do you allow somebody to die because they're lost you know and they don't think that their life has meaning i think for all of us as a community that's hard um 
So I, I would ditto what Anne just said, and I just emphasize a couple of points. One of them is, um, from my experience and um, uh, work in palliative care, the um, patient who is kept free of pain and si other symptoms may actually live longer. Why? Because that pain and those symptoms are actually a stressor on the body. So I would call into question the knowledge of palliative care of the clinician who said that. And I hear that that being said a lot. Um, so it's not just one healthcare provider or one family member that says these sorts of things. We hear this constantly. And the other thing is, um, what Anne said, the, the in, intent. Our intent, even if we're giving medication to um, prevent, prophylactically to prevent the, the suffering of someone who we're going to ex, <clears throat> extubate from the um, ventilator, take the tube out of their, their mouth, um, and we're going to give them some medication before we actually do that, because we know very well that if we wait, it's going to cause a period of, of suffering. So the, the approach is to give it ahead of time, then do the extubation. Even though we're doing that, we are only giving small amounts and then we can increase it commensurate with, with the, the symptoms. And in that case, again, we, we are not intending to end someone's life. We're intending to keep them free of pain and or symptoms. Uh, okay, John. Yes, we have a, a question from a group of people in St. Andrews, Mount Forest. Who decides what is intolerable pain slash burden, especially mental slash emotional pain? Canada abolished the death penalty, and one of the arguments was that one wrongful death was too many. Seems at odds with current debate on assisted dying. Question. Are there statistics around correlation of suicides, especially youth, in jurisdictions allowing assisted dying, given the message that dying is OK? okay that's right. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, let me deal with the uh, suicide one first, because uh, that came up last week, actually, at the CAS conference. And um, there definitely are some communities, particularly some of the native communities that are very, very concerned about this because they already have a high incidence of suicide, particularly within the um, teenage young adult population. And um, I think it definitely is an issue that needs to be talked about. But um, again, these are very different sorts of situations. What is being talked about in this instance is somebody who is dying, somebody who has a, a grievous um, illness or, and or disease. And we're not talking about the person who is um, uh, uh, healthy, otherwise maybe mentally um, having some, some real challenges in, in their life, might have substance abuse challenges. We're not talking about that type of an individual. Um, I don't think they would meet the criteria in any of the jurisdictions where this is permitted. Um, what was the first part of the question, John? I'm sorry. Who decides what is intolerable pain slash burden, especially mental slash emotional? Okay. And, and um, I think, and, and please feel free to jump in, I think the um, Supreme Court has quite clearly said it's the patient who is making that uh, assessment as to whether their pain, is, whether their life experience is something that is tolerable or not. What physicians are suggesting after that is that that request is made to a physician at this point. 
and that one physician actually explore that with the person, that they look at everything, um, they look at the disease or the illness, the diagnosis, the prognosis, what the treatment options are um, with the person, and that that's also explored with the second physician who actually has a specialty in the area in which there's an illness. As well, it would be a conversation about that person's particular experience. So two things. One is that we don't want people to die because they actually never got offered good care. And that's something that was raised earlier. There isn't equal access across the country um, to that. So we want to make sure people get good care and it's offered the second one that it is up to the person. Let me just say a word about uh, burden and suffering. Uh, and I agree with the, the patient, uh, certainly is the one who calls that. However, in the case I cited to you, uh, he also thought he was a burden to his wife who was coming in every day. Uh, the chaplain did have a conversation with the two of them and the wife didn't see it that way at all. Uh, she saw it as an act of love. Um, so, but I mean, that was that was his position and he sort of framed it as I'm too much of a burden on my wife. This is draining her and I'm ready to go. So it's quite a term, burden, and it can have many meanings like some of those definitions. And this is not new for, for any of us, that um, we live in relationships. And so for all of us, you know, I go into a room and I, and I say to Mary, how are you? And she says, I'm fine, but Tom's getting tired. I'd go through chemo again, but I don't think he can take it, so I'm not going to do it. Or you go in and you say, how are you? And Mary says, I'm so tired. I just can't do this anymore. But Tom hasn't given up hope, so I'm going to go through this again. So we live in relationships all the time, and we make our decisions based upon the people we love and how we think we're impacting their life and whether we think they can go home and, and then get up again in the morning. And we, if you ask us, um, life is more than just this physical that we've got. Um, there was also an advanced directive that I read that said basically if my life is coming to an end, just don't do anything to prolong it. On the other hand, if my husband or daughter needs something, you can put me on the rack until they get what they need. Okay, another question, Nikolai? Yes. First, I want to thank you for your uh, presentation. Secondly, I want to ask, apologize for my English, but I try, I'll try the best. I will start with a story. Uh, after I was born, my mother, uh, because I was born at home in December, my mother got a problem, so she went to the doctor and uh, she got an injection in the spleen and she cannot walk. So since I was 16 years old, she, I never saw her walking, yeah? I have to wash her, to feed her, to dress her when I was since eight years old. At eight years old, I have stolen her from the uh, hospital. That's another story. <laughs> How could you do that? And um, my father went to the doctor and said, okay, give me the permission that it was legal, everything, so. And the doctor says, in one week, whenever she will die. I decided to stole her because her nails were black. In communism time, uh, when you were weak, nobody take care of you too much. So she lived another eight years. And I promised to my father, I said, I will take care of her. Whatever she likes, I will do massage, a massage, uh, uh, ride her, I remember that I ride her with a wheelchair, 15 kilometers just to have an ice cream. So when she died after eight years, the doctor was astonished. So you said about the moment when uh, sh the person doesn't have the ability to say, to decide for themselves. Then the doctors has to decide. My question is, why the doctors not the family? I remember when uh, she, she was in the cemetery to be buried, I heard the rumor because all the community was there. The rumor said, better for her and for them that she died. 
and I totally disagree. It was me and my family who take care of her. We love her as much as possible and we did all the best. Eight years longer than it was uh, said by the doctor. Then another question for the chaplain. Where is God here? When we are talking about the believers, people who really believe in God, they like to know, as the others say, why God? Uh, he's not dying or she's not dying. Then the others may say, where is God? It is us who took the decision or is this God? Who is? If we look into the Bible, we can see Job when he has a big, big troubles. He cursed his birthday. He want to die. Praise God that he didn't die. Yeah? When we look to the others, to Jeremiah, to Paul, to many others, praise God that their prayers weren't listened by God. Probably myself, I was praying one day, I'd rather die than to live. Praise God that he didn't do that. So where is God? The other said. But now we, the question is, where is God in our decision? It is us or it is God? We are here under the presence of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lovely story. You're right. I mean, you make a couple of points. One is that doctors often don't know. I mean, we try often the best we can to think about how long somebody's got ahead, but we're often wrong. What families want to write, we need to ask. Um, because how we see a life from the outside is not how it's lived on the inside. And it's not how it's felt by people who love that person. And sometimes there is nothing worse than losing them. And they, there's value. But I'm going to ask actually Peter to talk about substitute decision making in terms of advanced directives when people lose their capacity. Because one of the things I think you're asking is people can ask for something, they lose their capacity, and then they've got a family. And how do we talk to their family about going forward with that advanced directive? So in general terms, and I can't talk about the specific case because I wasn't there and I don't know all the information, but in general terms, if a patient, if a person makes their wishes known that the substitute decision maker is supposed to follow those wishes as far as they're applicable to the circumstances. And so when somebody says that they don't want to be put on a ventilator, that substitute decision maker if faced with the decision about putting somebody on the ventilator and it's the applicable circumstance, then they're, they're not supposed to put them on that ventilator. If somebody said the flip side that they wanted to keep be, be put on the ventilator and kept going, and I've seen that in, in advanced directives, the um, substitute decision maker is supposed to follow, again, the prior stated applicable wishes. Um, what often happens in, in these cases is that people make different statements to different family members and put different emphasis on different statements. And so that's when we, particularly in critical care, we run into problems of where, um, well, she didn't tell me that, she told me this. A and so you get the conflicts within, within the family members. And also people will hear what they want to hear, which is an another thing. So the, the Patient will tell people different things and people will hear different things. And so prior stated wishes can be helpful, but they also can be problematic. Um, yeah, well, I, I have a few comments. I mean, you mentioned about uh, God and where is God in all of this. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, um, God can be all over the place or God can be hidden. And uh, um, certainly I, I believe, and this is part of my own faith statement, that 
uh, death is part of living that you know we're all going to die and and that's part of it so um, however uh, uh, does God want life to be prolonged um, I don't know and um, it, it uh, and engaging in families in this conversation faith-based families it's a very difficult question to answer sometimes the family is in agreement I, I've had conversations with families about uh, we think God just wants to take her, so let's let her go. I've had other conversation where one member might say that, another said, no way, no way. We're going to fight right to the end. And then you're dealing with quite a conflicted family and two different understandings of what they think is going on here, especially in terms of God. Um, so that's when uh, usually the chaplain gets called in to try and deal with all of that. <laughs> or the pastor, they'll bring in the pastor. Maybe you can solve this one. Uh, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, um, I don't have any answer for it. Um, okay, another question? Uh, when we were looking at the Oregon uh, situation, you put up an interesting slide of the percentages of people that are dying that choose to die at home. And um, my own experience with my mother dying at home was uh, we had a palliative care team, but a lot of it was left up to us as to when and how often we gave the morphine injections. And then at the end, after she had passed away, um, there was no accounting for the amount of morphine that we had given her. In fact, they did not want it back. Um, and they did not want to know. And this always kind of um, puzzled me because I felt like I didn't know whether we had given her too much too little, um, and it seemed to me there was a shift of responsibility from the medical profession to the family. Now we were fine with, I mean, as a family, we, we were okay with that, but it's sort of where the rubber hits the road that I find this whole discussion really complicated because um you know generally at home you would not be on a ventilator so that's that's really not you know end of life is not really uh, for that 90 percent is not going to be withholding cpr and intravenous bag or you know all that sort of stuff it's more the uh, the administration of these sedative drugs and how, so are we as a family, uh, like family assisted death? I'll just make a couple of comments. Right now in our country, about 60 to 70% of people do die in hospital. Um, so that's where the preponderance, I'm, it's interesting because I think in Oregon, they have physician assisted dying, but it's a prescription. So you still have to be well enough to take it yourself. When you're not well enough, you can't take it, which is why also it's done at home. But the US also has a hospice system at home. Um, part of what you came across is actually a very pragmatic sort of issue rather than um, for you, it feels like abandonment. I know some visiting nurses will go in and count the drugs but often people die at night and here's the pragmatics um, the government doesn't allow nursing visits after somebody's died because the person's died which means the nurse can't go back into the home unless he or she goes unpaid doctors are not allowed to take medications out of the home um, because they belong to the family so it's considered stealing and then they worried about the doc diverting it so that's the pragmatics. The pragmatics is if you die, aside from when the nurse is there, 
there's no payment to come back. A lot of nurses do. A lot of great nurses go back. They count. They say, how do we help you here? But in really tight situations, it's, yeah. So we have to change the system, not because people don't want to do it, but because we're told we're not allowed. And if we do, we can actually be charged or because the nurse has to go back in on her own time. So it's, it's, it's a system that in a lot of ways needs a lot of change. Other question? I'm in, inclined to shift gears a little bit because um, speaking regionally in Nova Scotia, we've had a lot of conversations about a, change, a changed approach to long-term care and the need for more beds and, and things like that. And I wonder maybe, Tom, specifically, if you could talk about how those conversations might be affected by pending legislation about physician-assisted death. Are you going to have to ask different kinds of intake questions? Um, are you going to have to, are we going to have to imagine long-term care in a significantly different way? Uh, or is this not something that will radically change the, the ground on which we stand? Well, we're, we're struggling here in Ontario with long-term care in terms of beds and all of that. And that's a big issue. And uh, um, the place I work at, they have sort of three uh, sort of steps in the last one being long-term care. Um, it'll be in interesting with, you know, this, this situation now with uh, um, um, physician-assisted dying. I still want to say physician-assisted suicide, but anyways, dying. Uh, how this is going to shift it, like especially in a, in a faith-based uh, facility, which is the one I'm in, uh, there will have to be a lot of discussion about this as based on, uh, you know, um, um, the sanctity of life because it's such a big uh, issue. So I'm not sure how it's going to all impact here. Uh, Peter, maybe you know. I would um, hazard guess that a lot of the faith-based organizations will just say, sorry, um, it's not in keeping with our value system and um, they, they will not provide the service. Um, there's a lot of other organizations that are going to have to really question and look at their their own value system because they're not from a faith-based they're from a culture-based um, long-term care facility and or or they're um, neither and those cases i think it's going to be less clear-cut for them but they're still going to have to look at the whole thing and whether they're going to provide it or not I just want to make a comment that one of the things Peter had said earlier was that in terms of Oregon, deaths, 31 deaths per 10,000 deaths involve physician-assisted physician dying. So a tiny number. I think that this is a really important conversation for our civilization to have, but I think we also need to have conversations about who gets their diaper changed, who's left wet, cold, hungry. Um, what families put people in hospital because we get right now in my community two hours a day of PSW and one nursing visit. Otherwise, you're 21 hours a day on your own. So we're having these wonderful conversations. I think we need to have them, but I think fundamentally we need to talk about basic care. We're not even talking about running blood, doing lab tests. We're talking about caring for somebody at home, like the work you did for eight years turning somebody, making sure they're clean, feeding them, making sure they belong to a community and they don't feel abandoned and like they should be a burden or rubbish or they don't belong anymore. St. Andrews Mount Forest is back <laughs> and they're wanting some clarification and so I'm going to rephrase their question and Mike, if I don't get this right, I'm sure you'll correct me. Uh, the conversation that's going on and, I, and he's thinking teenage suicide again, I think. Um, the conversation going on says, uh, uh, implies that people can be released from pain. 
And therefore, is there a corresponding rise in suicide rates? Possibly because people can see it as being okay. We're having the discussion, so it must be okay. So this is, I think, what I'm hearing in the question is, is there an impression among impressionable people um, who are going to say, well, our society is talking about this physician-assisted dying, so therefore, if I'm in a lot of pain, I can make my own decision. Is that going to impact suicide? Um, so I think, again, the key thing here with the physician-assisted dying is that this patient is dying. This patient has an um, a grievous illness or disease. And um, uh, will, will some people raise the question because they are um, also having some real problems, um, but they are not dying? Absolutely. But will they be um, granted it um, if the policies and procedures and so on are followed? I don't see them being granted the permission to, to have this done. It's always hard to know about whether having a discussion will actually cause something to happen or not. And I think we've, we're often worried about that. But I, I also find that having a discussion just allows people to express themselves, to be heard, and to go down a route and explore it. Um, and I find it so helpful to say what happens if we go right down to the end of this road, right down to the end of that road. People then, at least it's out in the open and people can get help or they can really think about it. It's not something that goes around in their own mind all the time. Um, Yeah, that, that's a very good point. And the discussion doesn't necessarily mean that it's going. you're promoting it or, or whatever. And I think this is a challenge for pastors and spiritual care people is willingness to go in there and get involved in the discussion. It, it's just like, I, you know, I'm a registered psychotherapist. If, if I suspect a client is thinking about suicide, I need to talk about it with them. And um, some people say, well, that's going to, you know, maybe make them do it. Well, might not either. But I mean, I then have to make a decision about what I have to do if, if I do think it's a serious uh, situation. Um, but I think in spiritual care um, and pastoral care, we have to be willing to go to those hard places because uh, sometimes when you get involved in not just this discussion, but other ones, you get changed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, your point of view sometimes changes. You hear another side, and uh, uh, and that's possible. Um, that's, but I, 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 I don't see. I actually, well, I encourage my students to have these discussions. Um, if I could, I'd like to go back to long-term care. I used to be a chaplain in a privately owned family run nursing home that was then sold to a um, multinational corporation. So it's private based. And I agree with you about who changes the diapers, who takes them to the washroom, who strokes their hand, who sits with them. And one of the things that concerned me, and I believe it's still the legislation, is that there was more legislation to protect the shareholder in the multinational corporation than there was legislation to protect the resident in the nursing home. So I, I don't know if it's really a question or a statement, is, but something about how do we engage in the appropriate protection of the person for whom the care is being provided over and above the economic um, possibilities for providing that care. Um, if I could just say one, one thing on that. Um, I really think that there is an obligation in all of our facilities, not just the long-term care facilities, but in all of our facilities, um, to make it clear to people that do not want this, that they're still going to receive all of the care that is necessary right through 
including after their death, that there is going to be no obligation whatsoever on them to have this, and they're not going to receive less care than they would if they didn't have this. I was just wondering if um, 20 years ago we were struggling with abortion. Do you see any parallels between these two difficult issues? I mean, they're very different in some senses, but are there things that we learned from that debate that will help with the protocol? So there's one, one parallel for sure, and that is if we didn't have any legislation on the, the, or if we don't get legislation on the um, physician assisted death, we could be in the same sort of situation as with the abortion where there is no law whatsoever for abortion. And we ended up having to get colleges and professional associations to develop the guidelines and, and so on for this. And we could end up still potentially with that happening. Um, but, um, the Liberal government says they're going to come forth with legislation, but um, it uh, what was certainly a, a possibility under the last government um, that they could have said, well, we're not going to touch this. And we could have ended up with February the 7th coming through, having it become law, and there being no re no legislation, no guidelines, anything, and people having to run and try to figure out what's going to happen next. That's the biggest parallel. I see parallels among physicians trying to think about how do we protect everybody. You know, the whole idea of two doctors, that's where we were 20 years ago with abortion. Um, people just don't know how to do this. Um, I think we're going to get it wrong at times. The question is, who suffers when we get it wrong? And who should be allowed to make the decision? I do see that parallel back there. Um, I think it's just hard. I think it's a hard question. I think as a society, we don't know. And the question comes down to, we don't want people to suffer, but if somebody's going to suffer, who makes the decision about that? And I think in this case, the Supreme Court said the person themselves has a lot of say in it. One other potential um, area of parallel is, um, my understanding is that in some of the provinces, it's there's basically no access to abortion, um, particularly in some of the um, Atlantic provinces. And, their PEI, there, there could be a potential that the same sort of thing could happen with PAD. It is, it is possible that you could get large groups of people, healthcare professionals, just saying, I'm not going to do this. And then what's going to happen for access? Okay, I think our time is uh, quickly running, and uh, I'm going to ask Andrew, if he would, to say a word of thanks. Okay, well, um, it's been a, a very, very helpful and informative afternoon as we've discussed these issues. People, different things, and people will hear different things. And so, prior stated wishes, can be helpful, but there also can be problematic. Um, yeah, well, I, I have a few comments. I mean, you mentioned about uh, God and where is God in all of this? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, um, God can be all over the place or God can be hidden and... Uh, um, certainly, I, I believe, and this is part of my own faith statement, that uh, death is part of living, that, you know, we're all going to die, and, and that's part of it. So, um, however, uh, uh, does God want life to be prolonged? 
um, I don't know. And um, it, it, uh, and engaging in families in this conversation, faith-based families, it's a very difficult question to answer. Sometimes the family is in agreement. I, I've had conversations with families about, uh, we think God just wants to take her, so let's let her go. I've had other conversation where one member might say that, another said, no way, no way. We're going to fight right to the end. And then you're dealing with quite a conflicted family and two different understandings of what they think is going on here, especially in terms of God. Um, so that's when uh, usually the chaplain gets called in to try and deal with all of that. <laughs> or the pastor, they'll bring in the pastor. Maybe you can solve this one. Uh, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, um, I don't have any answer for it. Um, Another question? Uh, when we were looking at the Oregon uh, situation, you put up an interesting slide of the percentages of people that are dying, that choose to die at home. And um, my own experience with my mother dying at home was uh, we had a palliative care team, but a lot of it was left up to us as to when and how often we gave the morphine injections. And then at the end, after she had passed away, um, there was no accounting for the amount of morphine that we had given her. In fact, they did not want it back. Um, and they did not want to know. And this always kind of, um, puzzled me because I felt like I didn't know whether we had given her too much, too little. Um, and it seemed to me there was a shift of responsibility from the medical profession to the family. Now we were fine with, I mean, as a family, we, we were okay with that. But it's sort of where the rubber hits the road that I find this whole discussion really complicated because, um, you know, generally at home, you would not be on a ventilator. So that's, that's really not, you know, end of life is not really, uh, for that 90% is not going to be withholding CPR and intravenous bag or, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's more the, uh, the administration of these sedative drugs and how, so are we as a family, uh, like family assisted death? I'll just make a couple of comments. Right now in our country, about 60 to 70% of people do die in hospital. Um, so that's where the preponderance, I'm, it's interesting because I think in Oregon, they have physician assisted dying, but it's a prescription. So you still have to be well enough to take it yourself. When you're not well enough, you can't take it, which is why also it's done at home. But the US also has a hospice system at home. Um, Part of what you came across is actually a very pragmatic sort of issue rather than um, for you, it feels like abandonment. I know some visiting nurses will go in and count the drugs, but often people die at night and here's the pragmatics. Um, the government doesn't allow nursing visits after somebody's died because the person's died, which means the nurse can't go back into the home unless he or she goes unpaid. Doctors are not allowed to take medications out of the home um, because they belong to the family, so it's considered stealing, and then they worried about the doc diverting it. So that's the pragmatics. The pragmatics is if you die, aside from when the nurse is there, there's no payment to come back. A lot of nurses do. A lot of great nurses go back. They count. They say, how do we help you here? But in really tight situations, it's, yeah, 
so we have to change the system, not because people don't want to do it, but because we're told we're not allowed. And if we do, we can actually be charged or because the nurse has to go back in on her own time. So it's, it's, it's a system that in a lot of ways needs a lot of change. Other question? I'm in, inclined to shift gears a little bit because um, speaking regionally in Nova Scotia, we've had a lot of conversations about a, change, a changed approach to long-term care and the need for more beds and, and things like that. And I wonder maybe Tom specifically, if you could talk about how those conversations might be affected by pending legislation about physician assisted death. Are you gonna to have to ask different kinds of intake questions? Um, are you gonna to have to, are we gonna to have to imagine long-term care in a significantly different way? Uh, or is this not something that will radically change the, the ground on which we stand? Well, we're, we're struggling here in Ontario with long-term care in terms of beds and all of that. And that's a big issue. And uh, um, the place I work at, they have sort of three uh, sort of steps in the last one being long-term care. Um, it'll be in interesting with, you know, this, the situation now with uh, um, um, physician assisted dying still want to say physician assisted suicide but anyways dying uh how this is going to shift it like especially in a in a faith-based uh facility which is the one i'm in uh there will have to be a lot of discussion about this as based on uh you know um, um the sanctity of life because it's such a big uh, issue so i'm not sure how it's going to all impact here uh peter maybe you know I would um, hazard guess that a lot of the faith-based organizations will just say, sorry, um, it's not in keeping with our value system and um, they, they will not provide the service. Um, there's a lot of other organizations that are gonna have to really question and look at their their own value system because they're not from a faith-based they're from a culture-based um, long-term care facility and or or they're um, neither and those cases i think it's going to be less clear-cut for them but they're still going to have to look at the whole thing and whether they're going to provide it or not I just want to make a comment that one of the things Peter had said earlier was that in terms of Oregon, deaths, 31 deaths per 10,000 deaths involve physician-assisted physician dying. So a tiny number. I think that this is a really important conversation for our civilization to have, but I think we also need to have conversations about who gets their diaper changed, who's left wet, cold, hungry. Um, what families put people in hospital because we get right now in my community two hours a day of PSW and one nursing visit. Otherwise you're 21 hours a day on your own. So we're having these wonderful conversations. I think we need to have them, but I think fundamentally we need to talk about basic care. We're not even talking about running blood, doing lab tests. We're talking about caring for somebody at home, like the work you did for eight years turning somebody, making sure they're clean, feeding them, making sure they belong to a community and they don't feel abandoned and like they should be a burden or rubbish or they don't belong anymore. So Andrews Mount Forest is back <laughs> and they're wanting some clarification and so I'm going to rephrase their question and Mike, if I don't get this right, I'm sure you'll correct me. Uh, the conversation that's going on and, I, and he's thinking teenage suicide again, I think. Um, the conversation going on says, uh, uh, implies that people can be released from pain. And therefore, is there a corresponding rise in suicide rates, possibly because people can see it as being okay, we're having the discussion, so it must be okay. So this is, I think, what I'm hearing in the question is, is there an impression 
among impressionable people um, who are going to say, well, our society is talking about this physician assisted dying. So therefore, if I'm in a lot of pain, I can make my own decision. Is that going to impact suicide? Um, so I think, again, the key thing here with the physician assisted dying is that this patient is dying. This patient has an um, a grievous illness or disease and um, uh, will, will some people raise the question because they are um, also having some real problems um, but they are not dying absolutely but will they be uh, granted it um, if the policies and procedures and so on are followed, I don't see them being granted the permission to, to have this done. It's always hard to know about whether having a discussion will actually cause something to happen or not. And I think we've, we're often worried about that. But I, I also find that having a discussion just allows people to express themselves, to be heard, and to go down a route and explore it. Um, and I find it so helpful to say, what happens if we go right down to the end of this road, right down to the end of that road? People then, at least it's out in the open and people can get help, or they can really think about it. It's not something that goes around in their own mind all the time. Um, Yeah, that that's a very good point. And the discussion doesn't necessarily mean that it's going. You're promoting it or or whatever. And I think this is a challenge for pastors and spiritual care people: is willingness to go in there and get involved in the discussion. It, it's just like I, you know, I'm a registered psychotherapist. If if I suspect a client is thinking about suicide, I need to talk about it with them. And um, some people say, well, that's going to, you know, maybe make them do it. Well, might not either. But I mean, I then have to make a decision about what I have to do if, if I do think it's a serious uh, situation. Um, but I think in spiritual care um, and pastoral care, we have to be willing to go to those hard places because uh, sometimes when you get involved in not just this discussion, but other ones, you get changed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, your point of view sometimes changes. You hear another side, and uh, uh, and that's possible. Um, that's, but I, 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 I don't see. I actually, well, I encourage my students to have these discussions. Um, if I could, I'd like to go back to long-term care. I used to be a chaplain in a privately owned family run nursing home that was then sold to a um, multinational corporation. So it's private based. And I agree with you about who changes the diapers, who takes them to the washroom, who strokes their hand, who sits with them. And one of the things that concerned me, and I believe it's still the legislation, is that there was more legislation to protect the shareholder in the multinational corporation than there was legislation to protect the resident in the nursing home. So I, I don't know if it's really a question or a statement, is, but something about how do we engage in the appropriate protection of the person for whom the care is being provided over and above the economic um, possibilities for providing that care. Um, if I could just say one, one thing on that. Um, I really think that there is an obligation in all of our facilities, not just the long-term care facilities, but in all of our facilities, um, to make it clear to people that do not want this, that they're still going to receive all of the care that is necessary right through including after their death that there is going to be no obligation whatsoever on them to have this and they're not going to receive less care than they would if 
they didn't have this. I was just wondering if um, 20 years ago we were struggling with abortion. Do you see any parallels between these two difficult issues? I mean, they're very different in some senses, but are there things that we learned from that debate that will help with the protocol? So there's one, one parallel for sure, and that is if we didn't have any legislation on the, the or if we don't get legislation on the um, physician assisted death, we could be in the same sort of situation as with the abortion where there is no law whatsoever for abortion and we ended up having to get colleges and professional associations to develop the guidelines and, and so on for this. And we could end up still potentially with that happening, um, but um, the Liberal government says they're going to come forth with, with legislation, but um, it uh, was certainly a, a possibility under the last government um, that they could have said, well, we're not going to touch this. And we could have ended up with February the 7th coming through, having it become law, and there being no, re no legislation, no guidelines, anything, and people having to run and try to figure out what's going to happen next. That's the biggest parallel. Did you want to? I see parallels among physicians trying to think about how do we protect everybody. You know, the whole idea of two doctors, that's where we were 20 years ago with abortion. Um, people just don't know how to do this. Um, I think we're going to get it wrong at times. The question is, who suffers when we get it wrong? And who should be allowed to make the decision? I do see that parallel back there. Um, I think it's just hard. I think it's a hard question. I think as a society, we don't know. And the question comes down to, we don't want people to suffer, but if somebody's going to suffer, who makes the decision about that? And I think in this case, the Supreme Court said the person themselves has a lot of say in it. One other potential um, area of parallel is, um, my understanding is that in some of the provinces, it's there's basically no access to abortion, um, particularly in some of the um, Atlantic provinces. And there, PEI, there, there could be a potential that the same sort of thing could happen with PAD. It is, it is possible that you could get large groups of people, healthcare professionals, just saying, I'm not going to do this. And then what's going to happen for access? Okay, I think our time is uh, quickly running. And uh, I'm going to ask Andrew, if he would, to say a word of thanks. Okay, well, um, it's been a, a very, very helpful and informative afternoon as we've discussed these issues. And as we can all see, they're, they're very complex. And they not only affect the issue of uh, doctor hastened death, but they cover a whole lot of things. Care of those who cannot care for themselves, the responsibility of our society to provide guidelines, but also to be compassionate, uh, not only to those who are suffering, but also to the family and the whole system. So um, Anne, Peter, Tom, on behalf of everyone here, we thank you for uh, opening our minds, helping us think helping us to reflect on these matters. And as I sat there listening, I realized how much we're still in the very primary part of this discussion and that there's a long way to go. And so as we, we go from this place, I'm sure we all go with our ideas, our thoughts, maybe even our convictions. But as my old father used to say, we need to hold them lightly uh, because indeed uh, we need to think compassionately about the whole breadth 
of those involved in these sorts of issues. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you for your input. And uh, you've certainly enlightened us here today.